Let's jump in. First off, I'm super grateful and honored to have you guys in this discussion. So thank you guys for choosing this presentation. Uh, I'm all warmed up and ready, just the two of them in Fiesta 6, so ready to rock. But I, I want you guys to know I'm super grateful for you guys joining and taking time out to, to be a part of this discussion. I, I want to cha positively change your life today. That's my, that's my main goal. Thank you. So today we're going to be talking about how to create a culture of employee and customer retention. My name is Sean Kelly. I'm known as the Carbis coach in our industry, but really I'm a father of three awesome kids, a husband of 18 years. I'm also a special operations uh, uh, combat veteran and the uh, number one best-selling book author of The Visitor. And I just, within the last week, super excited to announce my, uh, my newest book, Learn to Coach, Learn to Lead, which you can pick up from my booth. All I have to do is schedule a free coaching conversation with someone from my team, and I'll give you an autographed copy if you come buy my book. Um, that being said, most importantly why I'm here today is I'm the CEO of, of the premier coaching practice in the automotive business. We help automotive leaders achieve great results through their people and technology with a very unique approach to people development. We have a top-down and grassroots approach, and, and as such, we get to really take a peek under the hood of the inner workings of your, de your dealership, your service department, and, and your management team, and, and every, each individual on your team. So we get to really kind of take a peek under the hood on what their thought process is and their mindsets, and, we get to help develop these growth mindsets and help people grow as people. And we believe that when, pe when you grow your people and your, the individuals on your team love coming to work every day, they're gonna be more productive. They're gonna be more successful. They're gonna stay with your company longer. And today's presentation is going to help you guys clarify how, to, how does culture impact both employee and customer retention and how to build a culture of that. <coughs> You're gonna learn how to leverage the motivation requirements and success perception to retain your people and your customers as a leader. And thirdly, you're gonna be able to develop retention through your leadership routine. Your did it. Hey Keith, what's up, man? Keith's awesome. Uh, through your day-to-day -day activities and your leadership routine. So those are three takeaways you're gonna have. And uh, it was very humbling after the last few presentations. Several people stopped me and they're like, no one's talking about managing a store like this no this is like different and uh and, I, and it, in a good way and i i want you guys to leave here thinking totally different about the way you lead manager people in a good way so this is a very common saying a lot of us have heard this statement it's a quote from the famous peter drucker he's an executive and he said business goes where it's valued and stays where it's appreciated how many guys do agree with that statement fair enough so i bolted on a little three word sentence to that so do employees Employees are no different. They also go where they're, they're valued and stay where they're appreciated. But the word value is so vague and nebulous, so I'm going to help crystallize that with you guys later. This will be the overarching theme for today's content. And I've got a real dealership group case study to share with you guys where you can see the impact of this. So we'll start off with some, with some stats. But about two and a half years ago, we started working with the fixed ops department in this four-store group. And since then, they've had two consecutive year-over-year 125% plus increases in their, in their customer retention. And customer retention is kind of the bedrock for your business's future. Without customer retention, what do we have? You know the saying, sales sells the first car and service sells the rest. You guys, you guys agree? Raise your hand if you agree with that statement, okay. So retaining our customers is critical for us to be able to sell cars in the future. And now, what, what about customer retention? What's the benefits to it? Like, let's say we drive it up. How does that affect profit and things like that? We're going to talk about that as well. But this is their, this is uh, this dealer group's case studies around this, and if you look at it, they're above the region and they're in every in every range. But one year customer retention, they're over ninety percent in this in this report. But think about three months ago, we saw a report where they were at like one hundred and six percent retention, which means they're they're not only retaining one hundred percent of their customers within the first year, but they're also taking six percent from retaining six percent from their competition. And then look at the three to seven and eight to 10 year retention numbers. Keep in mind, when two and a half years ago, these guys were bottom in every category in the region. But now they're over 45% in the eight to 10 year customer retention mark. I think it's Stellantis as a whole, or about 8%. And where do most of your customer pay tickets, your highest profit RO tickets, where do they come in? Right over here. 
So if we can drive up the, both the short-term and the long-term retention, what will happen to our dollars per RO, our profit? What you're looking at here is their average profit. When we started coaching about two and a half years ago, they were just under $200 per RO, and now they are consistently over $400 per RO. So the, the money is real and the impact is real, but moreover, everyone loves coming to work even more because they have relationships with their customers. Their customers trust them. They don't get attacked by their customers all the time, which a lot of uh, service advisors we coach, we hear they're frustrated with the, the engagements, the type of engagements they're having with their customers right now. And people that, when you have a relationship with someone and you can't deliver due to a part or something along those lines, they're gonna give you a little more leeway and they're gonna give you a little more latitude and they'll be okay with things not going perfectly every time. And that's what it's all about. It's about helping you guys get these results and love what you do even more. And if I ask everyone in this room, okay, if you were gonna drive up your customer retention, what's one or two ways you'd go about doing it? Probably about 20 people in here. How many different answers do you think we did? Right, okay, that's one way to do it. What else, how else would you? Who would do something different than the atmosphere? Some people say, I'll do an outbound BDC. Some people say, I'll increase my uh, marketing to, you know, marketing budget to retain. There's a thousand different ways to skin that cat. And in a 50 minute presentation, I can't teach you all of them. You know what I'm saying? But there is one commonality with um, dealers, service departments that have high retention is they also have high employee retention. At least that's all the car motivator dealers we coach. That's what we're finding. And of all the car, motiv car motivator dealers we coach, we only have one that still needs to hire techs at this point. And we've, we've only been working with them for about 90 days. So I don't blame it on that, but we're, get, we're getting there with them. But most of our clients, they retain their people. These guys are no different. They haven't lost uh, a service manager or service advisor or anyone in a long time. But if you want to build a culture of retention, you have to be very intentional about it. It does not happen on accident. And we're going to talk about how to build a culture of retention intentionally. First, you gotta meet Steve. Steve, the service advisor, they're gonna love Steve. He's also taller than me, Dean, for the record. Um, big guy. So when, when we started working with Steve, um, we were given him observational coaching. That's where you watch someone play in the game and you try to help them improve their, how they play. Steve was, at that point, was the lowest earner dollar per hour wise. But Steve, uh, but we, we've since, if you saw that before earlier, you saw that he is actually uh, now running 418 per hour, which is great. So Steve actually, um, he was checking in a customer and it was a lady, she hadn't been there in two years. And he said, hey, I see you haven't been here in two years. Uh, thanks for coming back. Where have you been going? And she said, I've been going to the Jiffy Lube by my house. He's like, oh, okay, cool, well, welcome back. And he kind of walks off to get a VIN number and the coach working with him is like, um, hey, uh, so he asked the customer, hey, what, what are you, what's been getting in the way of you coming back here? And she said, well, I'll be, can I be totally honest? He's like, yeah, please do. And she said, um, every time I was coming in here after I bought the car, there was a different advisor. And it's really hard to have a relationship with uh, someone you trust. So it is kind of like 30 minutes drive. There's a Jiffy Lube by my house, so it's more convenient. I can get it done faster and it's cheaper. Not the brand we want to establish as a whole, right? So she, she shared that with us, and that reinforces the fact that if we can retain our employees and they can establish relationships with people, that they're more likely to trust us and come back to us and stay with us. And in any engagement, whether it's with your customers, or whether it's with one of your employees. You're either building, you're building them up, making things better, or you're destroying. There's, this is the mindset that we've got to adopt as service, as fixed ops leaders, okay? There's no gray area, there's no in between. You're either building or destroying. Case in point, when she came in two years ago, three years ago, whatever it was, and she had an undertrained service advisor, and then dealing with an undertrained technician, what was the experience like for her? Someone she didn't know or trust or whatever. What happened? She ended up going to Jiffy Lube. We in, that, in that engagement, we destroyed. We destroyed the relationship and she chose to go elsewhere. How many of you guys have direct reports? You have employees that report to you. You're a manager of some sort. Raise your hand, please. Okay, a lot, a lot of managers in here. Good. It's no different with your employees, my friends. In every engagement with your employees, you're either building or eroding. Have you ever left a conversation with one of your employees just feeling drained and exhausted? Like you just pushed a broken down trading up the hill and you're like, oh, that didn't go. Think about what happened, building or destroying there? Destroying, that's right. So what I want for you guys, I want for you to have the best engagements with both your customers and your employees so we can build them and build them and get to the point where we love coming to work every day and we can't stop the success. And I'm gonna show you guys how to do that. So check it out.
There are four elements that we can do to intentionally start building a winning culture. But before I tell you the four elements of a winning culture, uh, I'll give you a quick story that kind of reinforces this and sets the stage. I'm from Missouri, and we've got this river called the, it's a big river, and it's literally called the Big River. And we used to swim in it when we were kids. In retrospect, it wasn't the safest thing to do. But, you know, you raised in the 90s, that's how your parents treated you. So we can't, there's no helicopter parenting back then. So we, we go to the river, but I got a little brother, I'm 12 at the time or so, he's eight years old, four years younger than me. He runs down the stream, jumps in, and it's not a stream, it's kind of a raging river at this point. And I see him kind of swim out, and then he goes underwater. I'm like, holy crap, I gotta save my brother. So I run out there, I dive in after him, and like literally he's getting, and I feel the undertow, and it's sucking us under. Luckily, when I, luckily, I was just tall enough to feel the bottom, and I could kind of push him up above water. And as I'm doing that, he's gasping for air, and then I start to realize, holy cow, I can't breathe. I, I let him go, I swim to the top, I gasp for air. We, we do this back and forth for what seemed like an eternity, but it was probably just a few minutes. Then all of a sudden, I, I catch a glimpse downstream, I, I'm heading towards a bunch of limbs, it looked like there was a tree that had fallen in the water. I'm like, we gotta grab onto this tree. So we grab onto this tree and we're gasping for air and we pull ourselves out of the stream, thank God. And, um, and I'm like, okay, I, get my, I catch my breath, I'm like, I gotta get my bearings, where am I? And I, I look across the river to see if my parents are there and I'm like, wait, they're not there, where are they? And I look upstream and, and my family's running our way, but there were tiny little steps on and they're running. We were so far downstream at this point, had, they couldn't even realize it. And the reason I tell you guys that story is because your, your business culture is no different. Either You've got, you, no matter what, you have a business culture. Whether you build it intentionally or not, you have a business culture. It's a combination of the values and belief systems of everyone on your team, and it's there, okay? But if you don't build it intentionally, you, it might suck you out, and you might it spit you out somewhere where you don't want to be. So this is how, these are four ways that you can start to build a winning culture of retention. And the first way is communication. And what I mean by communication is communication should be positive and impactful. It should flow freely throughout your department, from parts to service and advisors to techs, and it should flow freely. And, should, and when I say positive, what I mean is people should welcome communication. Even if I'm correcting and I'm challenging someone because their performance is low and I'm trying to make them better and I've got to have a difficult conversation, if communication is, is being done right, they're going to see it as positive. They're going to want that communication. They're going to be like, man, my boss is pouring into me right now. This is awesome. Even if it might sting a little bit. When I say impactful, Communication needs to be impactful. I believe the highest form of communication is when people take action. Why else are we communicating? But there's seven layers you have to get through to get them to take action in any engagement. I'm hearing, but are you listening? Exactly. Now, even if you're listening, what if they don't understand? Yes. And if they do, and even if they're hearing, listening, and understand, what if they they, they still won't take action if they don't agree? And if they hear, listen, understand, and agree, they still can't do it if they don't have the uh, goals and that ability. ability. If they don't have the ability to do it, they won't take action. And then they have to want to do it and need to do it. And if all of those boxes are checked, they will take action. I promise you that. So communication has got to be positive and impactful. Second off, alignment to the direction of the company. Does everyone know where your bus is going and are they excited to be on that bus? Clarity around expectations. Expectations, um, without clear expectations, people make up their own. And finally, value of people. I said it earlier, I'll say it again. When people feel valued and appreciated and when they're, they're skilling up and they're learning the right things and, and they feel like they can grow with you and they, they know you care about them, they're gonna be more productive and it's gonna make your company more successful. So those are four reasons. Let's double click on each one. I'm gonna give you guys some of my favorite tools in my tool belt for, for each one of these areas. So first is communication, um, and that's a picture of I was, we, just before the war started. I was over there building some. Uh, built, these are the Iraqi soldiers we were training. Hey, I don't smoke anymore for the record, but I thought this looked funny with a turban, so I show you guys. But recruitment, <laughs> recruitment statement. Okay, in the first five seconds of any engagement, people pick a side. They're either going to battle you because they feel like they're they're being attacked, and they put up their defenses, and they're like, let's go, or they're going to join your cause to achieve a common objective. And that's why I call it a recruitment statement. We need to, how do we build an army? We can't let a war without a one woman, one man army. So how do we build one? We got to recruit people to our side. That way we're, we're aligned around a common objective. So I'm going to teach you guys how to do this. I'll get, let's come up with a real world example. I need you guys to think of 
one person that you need to have a difficult conversation with, whether it's performance, someone on your team that you need to have a coaching kind of, you need to help them improve their performance or, or something along those lines. Um, and you don't have to say their name. Okay, what you got? What's your name? John. John? Okay, John. Thank you for sharing. John, what's the uh, situation? I've actually there? got a group leader in the shop. Great worker. Um, a lot of a lot of attributes, but very condescending to people around them. People are kind of getting tired. Mm. Valuable employee. They're condescending. Helps everybody, but even when he's helping them, people still don't want to talk to him from time to time because he's condescending. Okay. I have the same guy. Okay. <laughs> Good one. Okay. We all have one. This is great. All right. We're just going to, let's just hash it out right now. I love this. this is good. All right. So, great. so they're being condescending. What's the negative outcome this is creating for them? I'm, gonna, I'm teaching you guys how to craft a recruitment statement to get by them, by the way. So what's you know, like even when service advisors, they'll have a situation they need his involvement in to expedite a repair or take care of a customer or whatever. They'll come to myself or to my service manager and say, listen, can you take this to him? And I don't, I don't even want to talk to him. It just... It, it's a breakdown of communication because people, are people don't want to communicate on that level. Okay, so it's hurting. But what is that costing him? Well, it, it's it's it actually is starting to jeopardize his position. Like he's he's so literally he lose he's his see it come around. Yeah. Wow. Okay. And now the par for the course approach. Not to say you would do this, okay, but would be like, hey man, you could be a jerk to people. No one wants to talk to you, and you're gonna get fired. How? What's gonna happen? Right? Put up the defenses. That won't work. Right. It won't work. Right. So we gotta get by and we need to, so here's what you do, you take all the negative outcomes and you flip it on its head. What's the with them? What's in it for me, if I was him, okay? What's the with them if he changes his ways? What what, what positive outcome would be created? created. Well, he did probably have less stress because he kind of stresses himself out, really. So, okay, so more less stress, more enjoyable work. Also, you mentioned it, he would get to keep his job long term. Yeah. So all you do is you take the, the negative outcomes, you, you say, what's the, if they change, what would they gain? Okay, and then you add what I want for you to the front. Write this out. What I want for you is add what I want for you is you take the negative outcome and ask them if they change, what would they get out of it? What's the positive outcome? Add what I want for you to the front of it and then to the back. Add is now a good time to talk about this. Some ways is now a good time to talk about this. Some ways to accomplish this. So, a recruitment statement for this, we'll call him Bob. The recruitment statement for Bob would be Bob, what I want for you is that you're able to keep your job here long term and I want for you to have less stress, enjoy coming to work even more and remain on the team long term. So you see what I did there? Is now a good time to talk about some ways to help you accomplish that? What's going to happen to the buy-in versus the other way? See, now Bob knows that I have his best interest at heart and I care about helping him accomplish something that he would want most. And now he's like, let's talk about it. And those difficult conversations, because you give them the gift of your positive intent, your communication becomes more direct and positive and impactful and you align. So now you get listening right out of the gate. Then you start asking some coaching questions, but we don't have time to get into the weeds and how to do that. But this is how you buy around any conversation and make more positive, impactful communication. Second, let's talk about alignment to the direction of the company. So as it relates to the direction of the company, what most people do, and um, we've all, I've been guilty of this at times too, I come to work, I start doing activities, like, you know, I got fires to put out, I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off, I'm doing stuff, and then, and then practice makes permanent. So those activities become my behaviors, and my habits, and then the, that gives me my results. And then my results take me to my destination. It would kind of be like doing, doing business this way. It's kind of like if you were going to go on vacation, you decided to go on vacation. Like, let's just get in our car and start driving and see if we end up somewhere cool. You might end up somewhere awesome, like Florida. You could end up in Ferguson. You're right, like, you want to end up there. But the point is, is you got... You've got this way of doing things. And people that come to work, and think about this, it doesn't matter if you're an A player. You could have the top performing shop or, or parts of the company in the country. But if you're coming to work and you're just doing stuff, are you really growing? You're living inside your comfort zone at this point. So what are what the high performers that, that stretch their comfort zone? Have you guys, by the way, have any of you guys heard this? Where does it, growth doesn't happen inside your what? Doesn't have, growth does not happen in here. So if you're just doing this, you're living in your comfort zone, you can't grow. So what do high performers do to grow? They are going to say, hey, here's the destination. Here's the vision I want to create. This is where, yeah, how do I want my shop to look in three years? How many more bays are we going to need? How much more revenue are we generating? 
what sort of management team are we going to need to, to staff up in order to, to build this vision for success? So you crystallize your vision for success, one that you're excited about. And then you bring your team in on it. You get them involved in building this vision. And then you set goals and benchmarks to accomplishing that. And then you figure out what behaviors need to become part of the day-to-day -day routine for each person on the team. And then you figure out what action you need to take. And even if you're an A player and you're already kicking butt, I promise you there's a whole nother tier because even Michael Jordan, who's an A player, had a, had a coach on the sideline watching him play the game, challenging him to be better. So if you create this vision and you challenge your team to help to, to move toward that, now you're stretching your comfort zone and that's where you get your growth. And then you take this to your employees and they start thinking, hey, I want to this. I'd like to be the new extra manager. Maybe I'd like to get a promotion. And how do people come to work when they feel like there's a chance that they can move up in their company and get a promotion? Yesterday, I was, uh, I've been having amazing conversations with a lot of you guys in here, uh, a lot of the, uh, the area managers. And, but I had two, yesterday, I had two different service managers, and I asked them, how long have you been at your dealership, and how did you end up there, and stuff like that. Two in a row told me, um, well, I actually was a service advisor, but I was stuck in my career, and I couldn't move up, and I ended up uh, you know, seeing a job ad for a service manager online and going there instead. And so now that's how I became a service manager. And I asked them both the same question, if you could, if at your last job, you, you felt like you could move up if you were being developed, and would you have stayed there? And they guess what they both told me? Yeah, yes. yes, absolutely. So create that vision and figure out where everyone on your team, will, how they want to fit into that vision. And this is the car oh, where company car. I'm just kidding, not. But the, the reason I have this creeper van here is because as it relates to clarity on expectations, when people don't have clear expectations, they're going to make up their own. And, and usually their own expectations are not good. They're not good for you, not good for them. Uh, in talking to a lot of the area managers, I, and I'm absolutely honored to be able to coach a lot of the area managers on, uh, in some of the business centers, and we have some phenomenal coaching conversations. And, and I've heard several recently tell me that turn, I'm like, what's your biggest challenge we should coach on? And they're like, turnover. I'm like, turnover at what level? And they're like, turnover at the service manager level. There's a ton of service manager turnover. And I'm like, what's causing it? And we start kind of figuring out all the reasons that the, the turnover is coming from. And, uh, and, and they're like, well, it's, a lot of times these people, they get hired on and they think, the service manager thinks they're gonna get paid X amount or Y amount. And then it's a whole different picture. And they think their, their schedule looks like this and then it's different. And they think their job responsibilities are this and they're different and they don't know. And if people don't have clear expectations, they make up their own, they're usually not good. And, and as a result, then the owner's expectations aren't met, the service manager's expectations aren't met, and guess what's gonna happen? We're gonna shake hands and part ways, hopefully as friends. So how can people win the game if they don't know the rules? And the same dealer group that we're doing, that this case study is all about, we start, uh, so, so this is Justin and I, uh, Justin, my director of fixed stops coaching guys, say hi to Justin back there if you don't mind, the handsome fellow right there. So Justin, he kind of snores at night. We've been sharing over the last couple of days. Uh, and he did no okay sleep. We did have a 3.16 a.m. fire alarm go off too last night. So that made for an interesting night. So but, uh, but I'm, I'm caffeinated and ready to crush it, as you guys can see. But, uh, but uh, Justin and I are coaching with this dealer. And, and my dealer, the dealer principal of this group says, Sean, I'm going to have to fire my service director. And it breaks my heart. I was like, why, why, is it, why does it break your heart? He goes, because he's been super loyal to me for years. I, I wish I could return that to him. He goes, why do you have to fire him, man? He's like, because he's not getting it done. Like I, I, every time I go to the 20 group, we're on the wrong side of the page. And then I try to, I go, well, what do you do? How do you try to address it? Cause like I go to him and I, I tell him we're on the wrong side of the page. And he starts making all these excuses and he tells me why he can't do it. And it's really frustrating to me. I leave there feeling like, and I get mad at him and I leave there feeling like I just pushed a burp down trading up the hill. Okay, so I'm like, what, well, what have you tried? And we go through the list and then I say, what haven't you tried? And he goes, you know what? I haven't tried to have you guys coach him yet. Let's him some coaching so we start giving him some coaching and this is a skilled tenured service director he's been educated he's been to schools he's been trained he's proven that he can get the job done in other cases but he's just not here and he's got his own challenges right he's got a, a free OEM service drive that he, that he has to deal with that's creates some unique challenges so we start coaching with him and uh, it was amazing the jaw drop moment so, so Justin and the service director come to the meeting with me and the dealer principal and uh, and the service director is like boss I gotta apologize to you he's like why he goes I've been telling you 300 was it, and, uh, and, and we did this uh, capacity assessment to figure out what he can actually accomplish. And so I've been telling you 300 is it, well, I think we can do 600. And the dealer like, what, 600? 
and he's excited and like doesn't understand. How did you go from like 300 zip for this? And he's like, Justin helped me figure out where I was missing. Guys, we all have blind spots. We all have things in our blind spot. And that's why it's great to have a coach on the sideline watching you play the game and helping you find these things out. And by finding out his blind spots and then Justin collaborating with him and his team and coming up with a plan and setting goals, now the service director is confident that they can more than double the business. So we sit out with the dealer, we get on the same page. Now the dealer says, okay, when are you going to accomplish that by? They come up with some deadlines and, and then they're all on the same page and they're all excited about moving forward. And, and the dealer has supported the service director since then. And it's been amazing. And they've literally, um, and we still have some work to do, but just in the last uh, 18 months, it's, uh, we're talking a $225,000 gross increase per month for a $1,500 per month co investment in coaching. No, since, get, January. since January of this year. This year, yeah. So since January of this year. So you can't win the game if you don't know the rules and we gotta make sure that those are clearly defined as it relates to expectations. And, and these success stories and Justin's relationship with some of the business center managers, that's Michael Cooley there, some of you guys may know him. We started doing Fix Ops capacity workshops in the Midwest Business Center and that has led to a ton of growth in some of the Solantis dealers there. Actually, several have come up to us at this conference and said, man, when I went back there, I changed my schedule to four tens and it's had a huge increase in our capacity and because we want to help, we want for you guys to be able to service and keep your customers and retain them. So there's a future, a bright future for us all in the car business. So we want to do these in the rest of the regions. And if you're interested in that, just put a bug in your area manager's ear. And I'll let them know, I'll be like, hey, can we do some of those capacity workshops and we'll spend a day with you, they're interactive. We build a whole plan throughout the whole day. It's really fun and everyone loves it. Um, and uh, as it relates to expectations, this is critical if you consider yourself a leader. Expectations are a two-way street, okay? Expectations are a two-way street. What I often find in business is expectations only go one way, they flow downward, right? So employees know they gotta be here at work at a certain time and they better get this much gross or whatever, this much hours per hour or they're gonna get fired. But, but, but then if you ask the managers, what do your people expect of you? It's like, Hmm. Do we know? So knowing expectations are, are a two-way street is absolutely critical. I'm a, we'll play a little game on this one so you guys can kind of see how this goes south when you don't know your people's expectations. So I'm going to ask you guys this one question. If you weren't meeting standards, if you were the employee who you know, wasn't getting the job done, so to speak, that people were scared to come up to and, and communicate with, okay? let's say you were that guy, how would you want your boss, your dealer, to hold you accountable. How would you want them to address it with you? Serious question. Think on that for just a second. Okay. Well, let me ask that uh, someone. Uh, let's see. Uh, Chuck. What do you think? How, how, if you don't mind me asking, how would you want to be held accountable if you were that guy? I believe it would be fair to <clears throat> have a very honest, straightforward conversation. Okay. Straightforward means very honest. Okay. It would be very honest. And, uh, and what, type, what type of forum? Just like a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, for one-on-one, -on -one. okay. Positive conversation. Okay, okay make it positive, individualized, one-on-one, -on -one, and very direct. Okay. Out of curiosity, anyone in here have totally different answer for this question? Anyone in here like just tell me, even if it's in a meeting, just tell me that I'm screwing up and I'll change. Anyone in here for that? One? Okay, you got a couple head nods back there. So the last group was much more split. Uh, who, who nodded their head? Who said, yeah, just tell me straight up. I don't care if it's in front of people. Okay, okay, you're back there? All right. So, okay, so we have a guy back there. He's like, just call, call it out. Tell me in front of everyone. I'm cool. Now, what if you were his boss? What would happen? Oh, yeah, I probably call him for everybody. And then he leaves up. He's like, my boss is a jerk. I can't believe you called out in front of everyone. And that's the thing. When we learn about the expectations of our people, we avoid all these miscommunications. There's this thing called the golden rule. We've all heard about it, right? It's do on others as we have done on ourselves. But there, as it relates to leadership, there's something even better, and it's the platinum rule. Treat, do on others the way they want to be treated. So as a leader, if we learn our people's, the individual or our team's expectation, and yes, it's not easy to learn everyone's expectations when you have 20 direct reports. And then yes, you're gonna find that they're all different, and then you're gonna be like, holy cow, I really have to tailor this, and you're gonna screw it up. Okay, you can't get it right perfectly all the time because you're human. And that's okay, you're a leader, you don't have to be perfect. But by trying to meet their expectations, how does that make your people feel about you as a leader? And they know you care. 
And then when you mess up, you can apologize for it. I do it all the time. I screw up, I screw up all the time, don't I? Well, not all the time. Okay, a lot. But, <laughs> but I always apologize when I do. <laughs> all right, so how can we build this intentional culture of success? First off, giving positive, caring, impactful communication. That's number one. Using that recruitment statement approach. To creating a vision for success, including your team and building that vision, finding out how they want to fit in. Three, clarify benchmarks, job goals, and expectations. And remember, two-way street, learn, learn your people's expectations. It's just as important as you share theirs. And four, and we're going we're to double click on this one, showing your employees how much you value them. Show your employees how much you value them. That will help you build this culture of intentional retention. Now let's talk about showing your employees how much you value them. All right, got parts managers, parts directors in here. Raise your hand for parts, okay. Got parts gurus and parts gurus, awesome. All right, so if you were going to, what's like, what's more valuable than your parts inventory? Employees, yes, okay, fair enough, I agree. They're definitely an investment. It's, kind of, it's funny how um, uh, payroll expenses on a dealer's financial statement, it kills me they call it payroll expenses. I think they should be called people investment money. Because that's what you're doing. Like you get an ROI out of your people, especially when you invest in them. But case in point, your employees, and there's something else too, your time. Your time is also more invaluable than your parts. I mean, that's our most precious resource that we have in reality to think about. So when a leader gives their most precious resource, the gift of their time in developing their people and your people grow, now you've got a proactive plan to prevent fires from happening in the first place. And when we don't have to run around putting out fires because we've invested in our people and got a team of proactive problem solvers, what does that do for our satisfaction as a leader? If you didn't have to put out fires because your people did it for you, pretty powerful stuff. So in years of failing as a, as a manager, um, so before coaching, I call it the BC era. You can read about it in my book. I would try to tell people what to do. I try to sell them on what to do. I try to, um, and then eventually if I got frustrated enough, I might yell at them, try to get them to do something. Not much of a yeller, but. But every time I was doing that, I was destroying and not building. But, and I would cause people to quit. And I, I, always, I always had this frustration, like I was retaining 80% of my advisors and, and sales team, but, but I had this 20% churn and it freaked me out. I'm like, how come I can keep soldiers alive in combat, but I struggle to keep a new advisor, you know, kicking butt at my store? Like, how come I have this turnover? I'm positive, I'm motivational, like what's getting going? <laughs> then I learned to coach and change everything. But, but all the, before that, all the people that would quit on me, I, at least I had a good enough relationship where I could be like, hey, why are you leaving? And they would be honest and tell me why. And I would get all these different reasons. And what I found was that almost all the reasons for people quitting fit into one of two buckets. It was either, um, it was either what I call success perception. So their perception of their success that they can have with my business. Or it was the motivation requirements. Motivation requirements weren't being met. And I started, I don't know where this came from, but I decided one day I was gonna kind of plot these things out on a graph. So I started plotting them out on a graph and that led me to creating my inspired satisfaction cultural assessment. And using this, you can predict and prevent employee turnover. And we do this for all of our coaching clients and it has a big impact on your ability to retain your people. So when I was in the army, I was in psychological operations and our job was to try to influence a target audience, help meet national US or support a unit objectives. And we had a saying, perception is reality. And, and because what we found was that how the Iraqi people or the Bosnian people perceived us is how they behaved around us. So if they perceived us as saviors and we were there to help them, they showered us with gifts and they, they wanted to help us and they'd give us the information we need to save people's lives. On the other hand, if they thought we were evil and we were the enemy and we were out to get them, they didn't really like us and things didn't go so well and they might help the insurgents put roadside bombs in the road and things like that. So there's a big difference if they perceive you and our employees are no different. So, so on the success perception, the Y axis, okay? Um, you got, number one, do I have the right work? Number two, am I being treated fairly as it relates to the rest of my team? Do I have skilled coworkers that I can rely on and trust to help me get my job done? Um, past work life, like what was my last boss like, you know, compared to my new one? What was the last job I had? You know, how much did I like it compared to this one? Um, Harvard is earnings potential. Am I able to grow my revenue and income here? Um, or, or is the potential not there? I feel like I've capped out. Um, outside recruitment, am I being recruited by another uh, business or another dealership? Work-life balance, do I have the right work-life balance? Is my, uh, is my family happy with what I'm doing? That's a big one, man. I'll tell you this one. When I put my 
viewership before my family, which I did for years as well, um, my wife was constantly trying to get me to change careers. And that wears on you. Because we as people will destroy what we resent. If we start to resent our job, we're never going to give it our all. Um, financially satisfied, can I pay my bills today? And then what, what's the, uh, what about other industries? Can I earn more or have a better, better success perception? Have, have any of you guys lost a skilled tech or advisor to another industry altogether, other than the carbon? Yes, okay. Where, where did they go? Where is it? Oh, they went to work in Oh, you're Texas. Yeah, you got the red here, Texas. Puffs, that's tough now, they make big bucks. Where, where, where'd you get yours at? Commercial sales. Commercial sales, okay. Wow. So yeah, these are the success perception. Then on the y-axis, you got the motivation requirements. You know, am I valued? Does my boss care about me? Uh, am I being recognized and appreciated the way I want to be recognized and appreciated for a job well done? Does my boss ever thank me when I go above and beyond? Am I independent, uh, aka do I have autonomy? Am I free to make my own choices? Is my opinion valued? Fulfillment, am I doing my job for more than just a paycheck? Like, does it actually mean something? That's a big one, man. You want to motivate people? Help them uncover a purpose. Aspiration coaching, I kind of mentioned that. Um, skilling up, am I mastering the right skills? Am I, am I, challenging, am I being challenged in the right way? Um, team cohesion, do I, do I feel like I fit into the group? Like, am I part of the team? Do we work well together? Is work fun? Developing, can I move up? We talked about that one. Can I move up in my career at the pace I want to move up? Do I feel like I can get promoted or am I stuck? A leader to model after. We all want a leader to model after, my friends. And, and I can quantify or clarify this. The three C's of leadership, all right? Care. Do I care about my people? Do, does my boss care about me? Character. Do I look up to him as a human being? Do I respect him as a person? Competence. Are they good in their role? It's interesting when you look at those care, character, competence. If you give them the fourth C, coaching, it fulfills all three of those. If you want to be a better leader, learn to coach. Finally, competition. Is there healthy competition or is it? So these are the motivation requirements. I'm going to tell you about Steve number two. This is Steve number two. Steve is a master certified tech. I met him a couple, about two and a half years ago at the beginning of the group. So the first time I met Steve, he cried on my shoulder. Had an awesome time, but he was so, super sad. He's like, Sean, oh, my, before I tell you about what he said, this guy has been there for, he's literally been a master tech for decades. He's a guy, he runs flags about 60 hours a week, uh, has been for a long time. Uh, he can pretty much diagnose any, no matter how complex an issue is, he can diagnose it. He's like a, a the car whisperer, he's a savant. Um, anyway, so definitely not someone you want to lose on your team. But how many of you guys have, um, you know, senior master techs that are thinking about retiring in the very near future? Raise your hand if you are. Okay, a lot of you guys, okay. Definitely an issue, we gotta hear out. So check this out. So Steve, you're gonna love this story. So Steve literally breaks down in tears. I was like, Sean, I'm gonna have to quit in, in just a couple months. I'm like, why, why are you gonna have to quit? He's like, because come fall, man, I'm, I'm retired. But I don't want to, but I have to. I'm like, why do you have to? He's like, my wife, she's telling me I need to quit. I get so cold in the wintertime up here in the Northeast. He's like, it snows and my bones ache and it just becomes really tough for me. I got this house down in Florida, we never go down there. Uh, my wife's like, honey, you retire. We got, we're good on money. We don't need money. And he's like, it breaks my heart. I was like, well, why, why, why are you so passionate about what you do? And he's like, I, just, I love problem solving. I love developing these other techs around me. And so he's a guy that all the new people can lean on and get help from, right? He's like invaluable to your team, not, not to mention the, the results he puts up. But anyway, so he's going to quit. Um, and, and coaching, here's the interesting thing about coaching. When you coach your people, it's the art of creating new possibilities. So I'm like, have you considered talking to your boss about this and seeing if it'll let you stick around and maybe go out and go to Florida a couple months later? And he's like, no, he would never do that. I'm like, really, what makes you say that? He's like, I just know, I just don't, I don't think he would. I was like, well, what assumptions do you make? He's like, all of it, it's all assumptions. I go, well, what, what have you got to lose in trying? He's like, yeah, I guess you're right, you're going to lose in trying. So we meet with the service director and, uh, and, and the service director's like, I don't know if that's a good idea. And I'm like, what, what concerns do you have? And he's like, well, you lose your skills real fast in the tech. If you don't do you know, work on cars for a few months, you can lose it real quick. And the uh, <laughs> so it's funny because uh, I have already known what Steve was planning on doing while he's in Florida. Work on cars in his garage. He's got all the tools you need to work on cars at home. So I'm like, well, what are you going to be doing, Steve? He's like, I'm going to be working on cars. I'm like, oh, it sounds to me like he'll stay pretty frosty or stay sharp, you know? And the service director is like, you know what? He's like, I'd be dumb to not come up with something to help you. You've been loyal, you've been, you're one of my best workers, you add so much value. It's like, tell you what, I'll, uh, how, how much time do you need off each year? He's like, 60 days, if you just give me 60 days, I'll come back here, bells on. 
So that was two and a half years ago. This picture was taken two and a half weeks ago. I was in New Jersey. My team and I were coaching their dealer group. And uh, Steve grabs me. Brady's like, Sean, come here. we got to talk. I'm like, okay. Brings me back to his bag. And he, and he cries and gives me a big hug. I'm like, I've got grease all over my suit. And I'm like, well, this is awesome. I love it. I'll go with that. Um, but he tells me, Sean, I just want to let you know, I plan on working here another 10 years. I'm like, 10 years? He goes, yeah, well, I, I plan on, maybe, I'm going to try to work on 75. Because thank you for helping change my life. And I'm like, brother, don't thank me. Thank your leaders for investing in you, first off. Thank them for being able to work with you. And, and, and guys, that's the power of, of understanding your people's success perception and motivation requirements, okay? You got some? Hey, you need to know I have a full time spot in South Florida. So, <laughs> 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 I'll send you a pound. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have to hire a full coach. I'll be saying it was the Texans that really get that cold. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it never gets cold. <laughs> <laughs> are, you, are you in the sales side or the top side? All right. Oh. So, so what, what this means, think about this. So it doesn't matter if you've got a master certified tech, a brand new advisor, or yourself. All right, we all, every person on this planet has a unique combination that if we can unlock, okay, we can, we can tap into superhuman motivation and passion and desire to retain with our company. And that's what we're talking about doing here. And then you have happy, motivated, excited employees. You have relationships with happy guests, that people, the people that trust, guess where the customers are gonna go. And guess what they're gonna buy more of? Your service work. This all ties together. And, and when you plot this out with our Inspired Satisfaction Survey, then what's pretty cool about what happens is you can see who's in your inspired satisfaction quadrant and the people down here in frustrated disengagement quadrant have a over 90 percent chance to quit within 60 days so as a leader you now can kind of predict the future and all of a sudden you know exactly how to move each of these people up and to the right and retain them on your team and this is why our motivators coaching clients do not lose employees very rarely because we help the leaders learn how to to crack that code for each person. So we've covered a lot of concepts, okay? Um, concepts are awesome and motivational and exciting, but let's get practical and tactical. I want you guys to be able to use the things that I've been sharing with you in your day-to-day -day leadership routine. So this is uh, Justin and I, we were doing one of our fixed ops capacity workshops in the, uh, the PDC up in Chicago, I think, or Milwaukee. Milwaukee, thank you. Um, and this, this slide's there to remind me about taking inventory. So imagine this, imagine if you took inventory of all the activities you do throughout the day, and then you decided to figure out which category, what type of activity all my, like each of my activities are. I promise you one thing you'll notice right away, you have management activities and you have leadership activities. And there's other stuff, you have customer fulfillment activities, you have finance, finance financial uh, activities and stuff like that. But if you look at your activities and you ask yourself, is this a management activity or a leadership activity? What you will most likely find, and I hate to be the bearer of potential bad news here, is that most of your activities are probably management activities. Yes, and everyone always talks about that, right? You see the posts on LinkedIn. Are you a manager or a leader? What's the difference between the two? And it's, but it's this nebulous concept. But if you list out your activities and you ask yourself that question, it'll, it'll become clear very quickly. So we build what we call, we call it building routines for success when we're working with uh, executives or managers. And we help you take that activity inventory, and then we help you kind of label them and figure out where they fit in. And there's leadership activities that are most likely missing. So these are the most common leadership activities that are, that are missing from your routine. Frequently missed leadership activities. So the first one are the four types of coaching. Right, the four types of coaching. So number one, am I giving um, my people aspirational, sorry, I'm saying, I've got six minutes. Right, am I giving my people aspirational coaching? I'm, Coaching them on their aspirations, their goals. That's where I find out that Bob, the GM, wants to buy a house in a, a condo in Florida, and, and Steve, the service advisor, wants to get his wife, his, his fiance, a really nice engagement ring. And, and now I'm not yelling at Steve to get his numbers up because he's not making enough money. I'm like, Steve, I, what I want for you is for you to be able to get your fiance the best engagement ring possible. When can we talk about some ways to get that to make that happen? And Steve's like, let's do it right now. All right, awesome. He just got you another hundred dollars per hour just for one coaching conversation. Awesome. And he, and he saw it as positive and impactful. Beautiful. So aspirational coaching, metric coaching, where you're using your metrics to set goals and challenge your people to grow in key areas. Um, observational coaching, where you're giving your, your, your routine, you're watching each person play the game and helping them grow. And you have turnaround coaching, where you have time locked out as a leader to help your underperformers, to coach them up, like the person that no one will come talk to. That could be part of a leadership routine. Um, you need to make time for strategy. 
Tactics are like you're, you're in the mix, you're fighting the war, you're, you're taking calls, you're filling in for an advisor on the desk, whatever. You're running a part out because you know all the parts counter people are on the phone and, and a tech needs it. Those are, those are all tactics, right? But when we need to block out time for strategy, where are we gonna grow? What's our vision for success, right? Let's have some team meetings. Let's, let's talk about communication and alignment and things like that. So you need to block time in your team for a leader. A leader is gonna have that vision and make time for strategy over tactics. Uh, training and people development. You know, what if part of your team is teaching your people how to be better trainers and coaches? How would that help when you bring someone new into the company and everyone's pouring into them and developing them? Now you're multiplying success rather than addition to your skills alone. Meeting motivation requirements. The 10 motivators that we talked about earlier, right? What are you gonna do to make work fun for your shop this week? Who are you gonna recognize for doing a great job this week? What leadership behavior are you going to model today that your people need to see? All those motivation requirements can be turned into daily activities. And if you do this, okay, and you bake it, it can all look just like that on a, on a calendar. You can have your phone even tell you when to go recognize someone. You just have to decide who you're gonna recognize. But these are, you, you know who you're gonna coach, when you're gonna coach them, what you're gonna do. What are you gonna do to make work fun every Wednesday of the week? So step one, take inventory of your activities. Step two, figure out what leadership behaviors you need to make part of your leadership routine. And that, my friends, leadership is at the center of success for your business, your growth, and your job fulfillment. That's what builds your people instead of destroys them. It's leadership. That's what builds them. Make that your one thing. Then try to fit all the management stuff into what's left over. And what you'll find, what you're going to figure out, is the things you need to delegate out. And you're gonna figure out who's missing from your team. And now you got now you get to be a leader every day instead of just a manager. So this changes me. And finally, I'm very excited, but schedule everything else around your leadership behaviors. And now everyone's gonna to start to my boss is a leader. He's not just a manager. Not that they already don't. I'm sure all you guys are pretty awesome. Um, last story I'll share is Tony. Tony Cadwick. Tony is a phenomenal guy. So when we started working with him in this group, uh, he just got the hire, he took a hiatus. <coughs> We sat out Tony and they're like, Tony, what do you want to accomplish? He's like, man, I'm going to retire in like three or four years. I'm just going to kind of coast, just kind of get the job done. I'm good at what I do and I'm, I'm going to do just enough to get by. It's all going to be fine. Then I'm going to retire. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm going to ask him some good coaching questions nonetheless. So what, in a perfect world, if you could design success, what would you do more of or less of, both here at work and at home? And anyway, he ends up saying, you know what? I've worked my butt off my whole life and I've always put my business before my wife. I got this wife, Lisa, she's amazing. And I, I, need to, I need to give her more of me, more time and attention. So, you know, maybe I, I'd want to do that, figure out a way to do that. So, so I'm like, okay, how are we going to do it? He's like, oh, well, now let me ask you guys, how many of you guys are here at this conference and you're thinking, when I get back to my store, you're worried about all the fires you're going to have to put out, a little concerned, like, oh, man, that's normal. Don't feel bad. That's normal. Tony's like, the only way that that's going to happen is if my people are so good that they can do my job for me when I'm gone. So he starts pouring, so we, we build his routine around that. He's, in, he's pouring into the, uh, Steve, the advisor we saw earlier, the big guy swimming. He, he's developing the people around him. He's teaching them everything he can do. So about six, eight months into this, uh, he's like, Sean, life is so good. We're, we're over $300 in our own. Love and work. My people are kicking butt. Like, I've been pouring into them. It's, 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 everything's amazing. I'm spending more time with my wife than I ever have. She's happy, but I've got a big problem. I go, what's your problem? He goes, I'm spending more money than I've ever spent, and i got to figure out a way to make more money. I'm like, okay, well, let's coach on that. He's like, he's like well, I, how, do you, how do you want to make more money? He's like, well, actually, I, I'm really loving this growth thing, and I, maybe I can become a general manager. I never thought about learning sales before. So this growth mindset led him to become, and just within the last 30 days, he just got promoted to general manager of his store. And, and Steve, the guy from earlier, the first Steve, got promoted to his service manager. Three, actually, three people have moved up because of Tony moving up in his company. It's a beautiful thing. And that's the power of creating a growth mindset. And that's where those $400 plus per ROs come from, the 0% uh, insanely high customer retention, and 0% employee turnover have all come from these types of conversations. And, and it proves that when we pour in our people, it creates reciprocity and it unlocks success and growth and, and true job fulfillment and satisfaction. And uh, last concept I'll share with you guys, and I do have a really awesome special offer for everyone in this room or anyone who's attended the, this uh, Mopar conference. 
But the last thing I share with you guys before I give you that offer is what I call, it, it, I don't call this, it's called the sigmoid curve. It's someone much smarter than me invented this. But it, it measures success here over time. And have you guys all heard the saying, if you do what you've always done, you'll get the same result, right? Is it true? No, we've all been lied to. We've all been lied to. It's not true. The sigmoid curve mathematically proves it. If you do what you've always done, yeah, you'll reach a peak. That, may, that peak may last for months or years, but at some point, because the, even if we're not changing, the rest of the world is, and we take a dip in success, that's why if you're struggling to retain your employees and you can't find good text, it's because you haven't figured out what, what do we need to do? We haven't figured out what change we need to make to drive the growth, okay? And how do we drive change? We have to make deposits in our people because we can't change everything ourselves. We need everyone on our team to change with us. And when you change, you're gonna take a dip in success. And this spot here, that's where the, you're in danger of going back to the old way. But if you'll make the change where you need to, and the way you need to, you'll break through and you'll exceed where you were before. And you won't have to take this massive dip. Because like Toys R Us decided not to change and what happened, right? So we gotta drive change and we do it by building our people and our team. All right, so coaching is just therapy without an action plan, my friends, all right? So I gotta ask you a few coaching questions. And I want you to put some serious thought into it. It's nothing you have to do right now, today, but, but put some thought in this. I promise you, if you answer these questions, it will change your lives. Change, it will change everything for the better for you. And I'll give you this offer. First off is, which of the four elements of winning culture do you need to improve upon? That's the first one. <coughs> Second coaching question, what motivation requirements are you missing in your service drive? Is it one of them? Is it five of them? Which ones? How will you change your leadership routine after today's conversation to make the deposits you need to make? What are you going to add to your leadership routine moving forward? What other action items will you commit to to drive up both employee and customer retention? And last, certainly not least, if you did have your own coach, if you had your own car motivators coach, how would you use us to help you build your employee and your customer retention? Would you want to build your routine and, and get control of your day and feel like you're getting everything done each day? Would you want to help build the motivation of your team to eliminate the laziness that we feel like our employees have? Would we want to help you turn around your underperformers? Think about that. If you had your own coach, how would you use them? And we have a program. This is our entry-level coaching package. Um, everything we do, customized for you, designed to empower you. We charge for this package, we, we do a site visit, we travel to you, this includes travel. We do a big stops, deep dive, we help uncover any blind spots that might be holding your success back or could cause you to crash. Um, we also are gonna put together a detailed summary docket. You get two coaching engagements per month. You get your own project manager and fix stops coach. And that's normally $2,900 per month. But because of our, our teaming up with Stellantis and Mopar, um, we actually created a program. You, anyone in this room can pick this up for seventeen hundred bucks a month, and I'm not kidding. This is for a seventeen hundred dollar month investment that could potentially give you a two hundred twenty five thousand dollar per gross per month uh, gain. It's a pretty powerful ROI. If you do decide you want to sign up during the conference, then we're going to give you a total savings of six thousand dollars, and you can pick this up for fifteen hundred bucks per month. And we'll also give you an additional half day on top of that one site visit day along with our inspired satisfaction survey of observational coaching for everyone on your team. And that is that has to be up to do that by before midnight tomorrow. And all I have to do to get that is scan this uh, scan this QR code. Okay? Um, we are at 215 Jeep Trail. Regardless of if you sign up for this, we care about you and we want to help you guys, okay? And we want to give you the gift of coaching. So if you schedule a free coaching call with my team, my team or I myself, um, we will also I'll give you a signed autographed copy of my new book, Learn to Coach, Learn to Lead. Stellantis leaders, it was an absolute honor to work with you today. I love you guys. Keep being awesome leaders. Thank you so much for joining me.